thank you to Claire and Coleman and everyone and all of these wonderful organizations, Vets for Peace, Physicians for Social Responsibility, Western North Carolina for Peace, and to every organization, uh, many of you I've, I've met at numerous good events here and elsewhere in the past. Um, it, it's wonderful that Asheville is an international city for peace, uh, and I have enjoyed coming to Asheville a number of times now. Uh, thank you to Ellen for doing that petition, uh, which I hope all those names will get typed in at rootsaction.org, which is one of my jobs and where uh, that petition is. You can also go to rootsaction.org on a computer and sign that and many other petitions uh, directly on your own. Um, so I'll try to talk for a while and think of the hardest questions you can and the most important questions you can to ask me and then I'll stop and we'll do questions and if I'm going too long, give me like a two minute warning and I'll shut up. Um, this will put it down. First I'll start with some questions for you all because I think I'm going to get wildly different answers from what I got yesterday at Appalachian State University. Um, so raise your hand if you think war is always good. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you think never. Yes, like I said, wildly different. Uh, raise your hand if you think sometimes war is good and sometimes it isn't. Okay, so th th those two were, were reversed yesterday uh, with a crowd of Appalachian State University students, uh, and I think that is typical of the United States, and this is atypical and admirable. Uh, and so some of, you know, some of what I have to say to you is material to take to other people who don't get it yet and, and convince them and bring them around to where you all are because you, you are rather unique, uh, although not globally, in the United States, you are rather unique uh, because we have a culture that is very, very accepting of war. Um, those of you who said sometimes, uh, I think there were maybe a half dozen of you, raise your hand if, if Iraq 2003 was one of the bad ones. One of the bad ones? Bad. Bad. The bad wars, yeah. <laughs> okay, right? keep your hand up or raise it if World War II was one of the good ones. <laughs> Only half. Uh, the Civil War, raise your hand for the Civil War was a good one. Or the Revolutionary War was a good one. I see, you gotta pick the good. If you're gonna say some wars are good, they can't be imaginary future <laughs> wars. You gotta pick which wars are good ones and put your name down and own them. Uh, how, about, how about the seven wars that President Obama is currently waging, the seven countries that President Obama brags about having bombed? Now, most places, including yesterday, nobody could even name them. Raise your hand if you can name those seven countries. Oh, that was the first hand. Yes, shout them out. Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, and Somalia.
pushing the climate toward uninhabitable uh, if it has not already done so. Uh, and, and you just deny it because it's not nice, it's not pleasant, to you'd rather think something else, so you deny it. Well, to deny what every single anti-Western terrorist organization and actor says motivates them, and to deny the logic of where the anti-Western terrorism comes from and where it doesn't come from, and to just pretend, because the U.S. media done not a single U.S. newspaper reported why ISIS said uh, somebody blew somebody up in Brussels. Not a single one. Now, they could be lying, they could be wrong, but you should at least consider what, what they said, right? Uh, so to, to shut that out and then just invent explanations, like they did it because they're Muslim, or they did it because they have dark skin and so forth, uh, it, you know, is to deny reality in a very dangerous way. The, the Gallup poll in December 2013 of 65 nations on Earth with the question, what country is the greatest threat to peace in the world? Which country overwhelmingly won? <laughs> Again, they, they couldn't, they didn't shout that out yesterday. Which country won in the United States? A single missile, which they're throwing at this region like, like it's confetti, 
is about $1.4 million, right? So these are our priorities. These are why people who can do it and then figure out how and want to take that strategy decide not to pay taxes, right? Because if you're living in this country or you're working and buying stuff in this country, these are your priorities, whether you like it or not or know it or not. Um, the, the percentage of discretionary spending is over half that, that Congress decides what to do with every year is going into militarism. It is the single most destructive thing to the natural environment. If you were going to start up the environmentalist movement from scratch now that had never had one before and you were not dealing with the militarized culture that, that just saturates our televisions and newspapers, the first place you would direct your energies would be to the United States military, which after, after two nasty corporations is in third place as a polluter of U.S. waterways, is in first place as a, a creator of Superfund environmental disaster sites, uh, is, is in first place in the U.S. as a consumer of petroleum, would rank 30-something if it were a nation, in a list of nations consuming petroleum. You can drive your car around all year, more than you ever have. You can live in your car. It's about an hour's worth of a military jet polluting the sky. The, the, the military is the big destroyer of the environment. And most of that petroleum that it consumes is to get petroleum to battle areas like Afghanistan to consume it in the struggle to maintain domination over petroleum-rich areas to get more petroleum with which to further destroy the world. It's absolute madness. Uh, and that you can't get the big environmental groups to say a word, uh, it, it, it may prove fatal. Um, the, the militarism is the number one destroyer of our rights, as you know, and militarization of our police, and they give the weapons away so they can buy new ones. We, we have fewer rights and freedoms after every war for freedom. We, we are destroying our culture and our morality through our acceptance of war, including through the advancement of racism and bigotry that is justified by the war. So because if you accept that it's okay for the president to brag about bombing seven dark-skinned Muslim countries, uh, then you have to accept there must be something wrong with dark-skinned Muslims. And you begin to see not just the erosion of civil liberties and rule of law, but the, but the, the spread of this sort of racism. If, if Obama's drone victims, if the men, women, and children he picked off a list to have murdered every Tuesday were white, he would have been impeached before 2010. There is no question by this Congress. But because they're not white, the Republicans don't care, neither do the Democrats. In fact, the Democrats have avoided even knowing he does these things. Right? So we have, we have this sort of impact that is very subtle of, of militarization on our culture. Just to quickly go through the, the seven uh, larger U.S. wars at the moment, Afghanistan, by days, deaths, and dollars far and away, President Obama's war, not George W. Bush's, uh, and Afghanistan dramatically worse off, and the Taliban dramatically more in control now, uh, for what that's worth, than 15 years ago. Uh, Pakistan dramatically less worse, the less well-off, uh, less stable. This is, a, this is a nuclear country where the, the son of the guy who was in charge of the nuclear weapons tried to blow up a bomb that luckily wasn't nuclear in Times Square uh, and said it was because of his anger at the, at the drones and the missiles. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a movie just now hitting theaters called Eye in the Sky. Have you seen this or seen a preview for it? Seen a preview? This is... Uh, this is a, a, a movie with Helen Mirren uh, and other big name actors. Uh, we, we had a half dozen, eight, ten good movies about drones and theatrical plays about drones that it never really struck me were, were all on our side. They were all like helping improve our understanding of what it means to be murdering all these people. Uh, it, and it didn't strike me until I saw this one, which is hardcore pro-drone propaganda. And it is, it is much 
more slickly produced, produced in collaboration with the U.S. military, and everybody's going to see it. Uh, and they're not going to walk away thinking it's pro-drone propaganda, because good propaganda doesn't give people that impression. They're going to think it's a serious moral examination of how dangerous it is to kill civilians and collateral damage and so forth. But in this movie, the targets are all known and named and include a white person, which never happens, so it's not racist. And they're and they're and they go into a neighborhood in Somalia that's controlled by Al Shabaab, so they cannot possibly be captured. And they send a, a drone the size of a bug into the house with a camera to watch them putting on suicide vests. They're about to go blow up hundreds of people in a shopping mall. Uh, and so you have you have people identified by name, their stories and background rarely happens. Most of these people that are targeted without having any idea who they are. You have people who actually can't be captured. As far as we know, has never happened. And we know of many, many cases where people could have been quite easily arrested and weren't. The, the choice being to, to stop bringing people to Guantanamo instead to kill them. Uh, and they're actually an honest to God imminent threat to kill more people, uh, which, which has absolutely never happened at all much less an imminent threat to the United States, which is part of Obama's promise that he would never kill anyone with a drone unless no innocents would die, they were identified, and they couldn't possibly be captured, and they were an imminent threat to the United States. Even in the movie Fantasy, these people with their suicide vests were not about to jump across the Atlantic Ocean, right? They were about to go to a shopping mall. And, and, and so, you have this fantasy, and I saw this movie with the director and a general from the military sitting next to him, and they flew a drone around the theater, and they said, see, look, it's all true. It's all lies. It's all lies, and we have to explain to people the difference between these lies and what's really happening in places like Pakistan. Three, Iraq. Obama promised to get out quickly, got out as slowly as possible, never actually got out, and hurried up and got back in. And they're now putting more and more troops back into Iraq, which is dramatically worse. Uh, and in the meantime, have been giving the missiles to the Iraqi government with which to blow up its own people, with which to fuel the growth of, of, of ISIS out of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which didn't exist before 2003, and has been largely armed by US and other weapons in the possession of the Iraqi government that abandoned them. Uh, Syria. The scandal of Hillary Clinton is not that she used her computer at home. It's what she used it for. It's what she wrote. It's the fact that she and Google and, uh, and her friends were trying to overthrow the government of Syria. And there was a real popular rebellion in Syria. Uh, but the CIA and the United States State Department were seeking to manipulate it before it happened and since. Uh, that they have flooded that country with arms from Libya, uh, including through the disastrous overthrow of the Libyan government. Uh, and, and they have been arming al-Qaeda uh, in Syria, intentionally, knowingly, uh, and indirectly arming ISIS in Syria. And their goal remains to overthrow the government of Syria. So in 2013, something very remarkable happened. President Obama had promised John McCain and everybody on the Hill that they were, that they were going to bomb the hell out of Syria. 500 pound bombs everywhere. It just would have put ISIS in charge. And, and Northrop Grumman's stock was at record high. Every media outlet said it was about to happen. Everybody knew it was about to happen. And the public said no. And the Congress members were on break. They were in their district and they were being confronted on camera, why should we join us some more on the side of Al-Qaeda? And the House of Commons in London said no for the first time since Yorktown because of popular demand. And it wasn't just the immediate, unprecedented, before or since flood of emails and phone calls to Congress. And it wasn't just that it was Jewish holidays and APAC was away. And it was, it was like a perfect storm, but it was a perfect storm at the end of a decade of education and agitation around Iraq. And you had Congress members saying, I don't want to vote for another Iraq, uh, which of course prevented Hillary Clinton from getting the nomination eight years ago. Uh, and, and so you, you had President Obama reverse himself and admit to the Atlantic Magazine, as they never admit, that it was popular pressure. 
right? I mean, this is the biggest lie. They pretend not to care what the public is doing. And here they do have an actual admission in almost real time, just a few years later, that it was public pressure. But in the polls, not in the activism, but in the polls, the public was even more opposed to army proxies on the ground. And President Obama asked the CIA to do a report of every time in history, and there's a lot of them, that the US has armed proxies in a war abroad. Had, they, had it ever worked in the military's own terms, had it ever succeeded in any way? And guess what the CIA said? They, they, they had one sort of success, which was 1980s Afghanistan. Anybody think of any undesirable results? <laughs> <laughs> right, September 11th. So, so, so he did it anyway, right? You ask for the report, then you do it anyway. Uh, and they've been making things worse in Syria ever since. But a year later, after this sort of evidence that people were starting to get it, that they hadn't forgotten Iraq yet, that they had learned something. Not a year later, you had videos of white people, American people, having their throats cut. And everything changed. And now it was okay to get into the same war, but on the opposite side, while still on the same side, and it made absolutely no sense, but millions of people said, oh, okay, because I'm scared, and when I'm scared, I'm stupid. <laughs> and, and so we're, up against, we're not up against the question of information or logic here. We're up against the ability to resist stupid fear. Uh, and, and this is what changed in 2014. Resistance to war lies absolutely collapsed. Um, Libya, you know, Lib when, when Hillary Clinton is in office, you don't have the Donald Trump approach of let's kill them because we hate them and we want to steal their oil. You know, you don't have this sort of brutal honesty. You have this pretense of trying to save civilians who Gaddafi has supposedly threatened when he hadn't threatened and he hadn't been slaughtering civilians and it was all a lie, but they get a UN resolution to protect the civilians and then they immediately go in to overthrow the government and create living hell in Libya, which was the goal all along and had nothing to do with noble motives, as you can read in Hillary's emails. Uh, Yemen. Yemen was a success story for Barack Obama, uh, merely because it hadn't become a, a, a world-class disaster yet, uh, for, for drone wars. And people would say to you, yeah, but a drone war is better than a ground war. And I would say to them, well, we didn't have a ground war. We had no war. So a drone war is, is worse. It's going to lead to, a, to an air war and a, and a ground war, trust me. Uh, and it has. And after Saudi Arabia gave the Clinton Family Foundation over $10 million, as numerous Gulf states did, uh, and as, after she waived restrictions on selling US weapons to brutal governments, uh, and after Boeing, after Boeing gave $900,000 to Secretary of State Clinton's Family Foundation, uh, the jets went to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is now bombing families in Yemen with active support of the U.S. military and, and dramatically increasing recruitment for al-Qaeda in Yemen. Uh, so, uh, last one, Somalia is yet another case of making things worse by killing people with drones, as every top official involved admits the minute they retire, from Stanley McChrystal to all the heads of, of uh, of national intelligence and CIA operations and the Laden effort for the CIA. And so as soon as they retire, it's counterproductive. We're producing more enemies than we're killing. You can't kill your way out of this, etc. While they're in, they don't say it. Um, the, the other success story for resisting war lies, in a way, maybe a Pyrrhic victory, was the, the creation of the Iran nuclear agreement. Because the opposition in Washington was demanding war instead just as they've been demanding war in 2007 and at other moments. Uh, and and it, it's amazing how well people have resisted that and, and resisted the Israel lobby in Washington in a, in a way that was unprecedented. Uh, but both sides in the debate over the Iran agreement pushed the same lies on the US public. Both sides said Iran is trying to get a nuclear weapon and wants to nuke us. And one side said the correct approach to that is to create this agreement and go control their nuclear program. The other side, the correct approach is not to talk to them and bomb them. 
But they both push the same lies, and the U.S. public believed it. So the U.S. public is in a worse place now regarding Iran if some incident occurs or is manufactured. Uh, the, you know, the, the argument that I really had to go into yesterday at Appalachian State, and maybe I can just skim over really quickly here, uh, is that if you go through all of these recent wars and current wars, and you don't like any of them, most, a lot of people in the United States are going to agree with you, but they're going to say there could be a good war next week. And you're going to say, well, prove it. When has there ever been one? And 99% of them are going to scream World War II at you at the top of their lungs. Some are going to talk about the Civil War. I don't know if you have to say war between the states or war of Northern Aggression in, in Nashville, but uh, whatever you call it. Uh, or some are going to say the, the U.S. Revolution, you know. And, and, and so you have to walk people through, you know, that, you know, Canada didn't have a revolution and they're doing fine, thank you. Most countries ended slavery without a civil war. Uh, the South didn't actually want a war. Uh, it wanted to leave and create a separate country. Uh, and the North didn't actually, the government of the North didn't actually want to end slavery in the South. It wanted to stop slavery from spreading further west. So if, if both parties had, had just simply agreed on not spreading the country further west, or if the North had agreed to let the South go, you know, so in, in these senses, the Civil War was, a, was a, an imperial war like all the others, like the Revolution was a war for westward expansion uh, into native territory. Uh, and of course, World War II, I mean, the ships with refugees within sight of Florida were turned away. Eleanor Roosevelt, contrary to Hillary Smith, that you cannot question your husband, the president, was publicly demanding that, that Jewish refugees be let into this country, and thousands of good families were lined up to take Jewish children. Franklin Roosevelt would not stand for it. Congress would not stand for it. The majority of the U.S. public would not stand for it. There was never a single poster demanding war on the Nazis to save the Jews. They were not, never mentioned. Uh, you know, and the, and the, uh, except by the peace activists who were demanding that they be saved. I mean, the Western governments had meetings pre-World War II and decided they wouldn't let Germany send all the Jews anywhere because they weren't wanted, right? If this was the Nazis' plan was to ship all the Jews out of Germany, which is insane and unjust and ridiculous, but better than killing them. Uh, and the, the demands of peace activists to end the war before everybody's killed uh, were just unheeded. Uh, and, and so it, this, you know, not to mention the almost down to the date predictions by wise people at, 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 upon the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I as to when World War II would occur as a result. And the decades of Wall Street investing in the Nazis <coughs> greater than anywhere else on earth as a preferable alternative to the communists. And so, I mean, these were choices. These were bad choices. This, war, this was not something inevitable, and it certainly was not something good. It was the single worst event uh, in any short period of time that this species has done to itself. Uh, and the, the intentional provocations of Japan for years uh, and the appreciation of the Japanese attack and the promise to Churchill to get into the war and the declaration of war that, that Roosevelt drafted that night against two countries and then took one out and waited for Germany to declare war on the United States. I mean, these, these things have to be understood uh, in order to, to demythologize World War II because it just hangs over. It, you know, you can, ex you can accept, as millions of Americans do, that there hasn't been a good war in 70 years. But because of World War II, you still have to dump over half your resources every year into the war machine which kills primarily by stealing those resources. Um, and, and of course, if the World War II became the good war, it, it, in the Vietnam era, when Vietnam was the bad war, uh, and the Pentagon is now putting $65 million into a campaign to celebrate the, the goodness of the Vietnam War. And President Obama has declared the Korean War a victory after decades of it being a futile stalemate. They are building a World War I monument in Washington, D.C. now to go along with the World War II monument. They, they, are, they understand the importance of lies about past wars. Well, we have to as well. They are far more damaging than lies about upcoming wars. Um, so we, we have, if you 
watch basketball games, if you watch the, the NCAA tournaments, um, you know, two things you'll notice. First, Virginia's going to win. Second, <laughs> second they thank the troops for watching in 175 countries. And nobody blinks. It's considered normal. You know, there are less than a dozen military bases around the world owned by one country but in a different country, except for the U.S. ones, right, where there may be as many as a thousand, depending on how you count it. Uh, and this is unprecedented. This is unheard of uh, to be occupying the world and taking the few nations that don't have U.S. troops in them, like Iran and Syria, and declaring them threats to, to peace and harmony on Earth. I mean, this is, this is madness, and it's driven by a desire for global domination. And people who thought it would stop when the Soviet Union went away because they were lying about the communist threat for all those years didn't get it, right? And the fact that they've come up with a far better threat than communism in terrorism, which can never go away, uh, it, you know, has to be understood and, and confronted by recognizing the real motivations which have nothing to do with communism or terrorism. Um, so it, you know, if the United States were to just scale back and make the Department of Defense defensive and just have something resembling what other countries have and defend its borders and so forth, you could cut 90% and you could cut the nukes. You got 15,000 nukes ready to go, destroy the Earth thousands of times over, and a handful of them in a limited nuclear engagement it's going to put so much soot into the sky. This place is going to drop 50 degrees. You're going to be unable to grow food. Everybody in this country is going to starve. And what is the U.S. military doing? It's developing smaller nukes that it calls, quote unquote, more usable. <laughs> this is insanity. This is insanity. This, you don't have to eliminate hatred and violence and conflict. You have to eliminate the weaponry. The Middle East is not an inherently violent place. Where do you think the majority, the vast majority of the weapons in the Middle East come from? The United States of America. For several years until recently, about 80%, according to the Congressional Research uh, Office, and now about 60% in just recent years, of weapons agreements to sell weapons to Middle Eastern governments. Uh, this doesn't count the weapons given to terrorist groups. This doesn't count the U.S. weapons that it takes there itself. I mean, this is a, this is a region armed to teeth. It is very difficult to be as violent without the weaponry. I mean, here we are in a country where three-year-olds with guns kill many more people than foreign terrorists. But we don't understand that, that less damage would be done if the weapons were taken away, right? So if the United States wanted to start disarming the Middle East, stop crying, destroy ISIS, is across the U.S. political spectrum, we can all agree to destroy ISIS, which is, of course, going to enlarge ISIS or some other name. Uh, disarm ISIS. Stop the weapons. The United States could cut off two-thirds, three-quarters itself alone. You know, this, is, this is the approach I'd like to see. Um, About two more minutes or so. Or okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe three or four. When, when, I, when I asked yesterday, is war legal? I got, I got a certain number of hands. How many hands do I get here if I ask, is war legal? No. Why is it illegal? <laughs> so some people may know that I wrote a book, a little blue book over here, about the kellogg briand Pact, which the peace movement of the 1920s created, which is still on the books, which makes every war illegal. Even under the UN Charter, which most people still recognize as existing, uh, I mean, the State Department recognizes both as existing, just violates them every day. Uh, all the current wars are illegal. Because under the UN Charter, you have to either be acting in actual defense or it has to be authorized by the UN Security Council, which none of these wars are. So they're, they're all illegal. They, and, and when they got the pretense of an authorization on Libya, you're pretending they're going to protect people and then continuing to overthrow the government. Russia and China actually learned something and on Syria said, no, no, not again. Well, they said, well, who cares? I'm just going to do it anyway. And in fact, Obama went to 
Congress and gave his final State of the Union address and said, I'm going to do this war with or without you, and, and spit on them, and they stood up and cheered. Uh, so, it, so, it, so you have the, the international illegality, you also have this the more constitutional illegality, but numerous other ways in which these wars are illegal. Um, the, uh, the other thing you get is that war is inevitable, that war is natural. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a case of PTSD from war deprivation. <laughs> <laughs> it's always from war participation. There's nothing natural about it. Uh, and, and there are things we can do that are effective. I mean, I talked about 2013 Syria, 2015 Iran agreement. The people that we just heard about Okinawa, where they have just, at least for the moment, stopped of being a U.S. military base, we have to be supporting them in Washington and cheering for them and making that a global effort that includes the United States. Um, we, we have to recognize our power because the, the top lie they tell is that we're powerless. They pretend not to notice us. And, and when, you, when you go back and, and read the FBI files on past peace activists and so forth, you, you know, you, the first thing you learn is that they all had FBI agents in their organization. The second thing you learn is that they were far more effective than they ever imagined, you know, and that, and that the government was paying close attention to everything the public did while pretending not to. Uh, I met a young man at Appalachian State who's in the National Guard and getting out as a conscientious objector. Uh, and I met, a, I met a number of students who want to volunteer in the peace movement in any way they can. So if you all get in touch with me tomorrow, I want to put you in touch with all of these students at Appalachian State. Uh, they need to be embraced by this community, even though I'm going to put them to work uh, on what I'm doing. Um, and and, and uh, an international city for peace needs to work in an in a international league and with the National Conference of Mayors and Mayors for Peace. And so because Washington is hopeless, globally, locally, state level, we, are, we have a chance at a better politics. Write Washington off for the moment and build up the power of Asheville working with other cities. Um, what I'm doing with World Beyond War, I, I want to pass around this uh, statement that says, I want to work to end all war, and you can put that in name and, uh, and so forth. The hundred and, I think we have people who've signed 133 countries and growing, uh, and we're organizing movements out of that. If you can pass that around and sign it if you're so inclined. Um, and we're praying, but we haven't announced yet, but we're planning a big conference in Washington, D.C., September 23rd to 25th, with a big nonviolent action that's part of it. Uh, we'll be announcing that and hope you can come. Um, and finally, corporations are people. <coughs> money is not speech, but money is buying books, and that's how I try to make a living. So buy some books and ask some, some tough questions, please. Thanks for coming.